great. Thank you for coming. Welcome to uh, Potrero Hill History Night. I have the great honor and privilege of having a conversation with a gentleman whom I've known for 55 oh, years, years. Okay, uh, which it. is kind of a long time um, among friendships in this city. So I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to have a conversation with him. And we've chatted um, often over the last 55 years, but not perhaps as intently as we will tonight. Have a seat, have a seat. The first thing I'd like to do is um, introduce uh, Art's wife. I know that for a Greek gentleman, family probably means more than anything in the whole world. And I have the honor of introducing to you Sherry Agnes. It's interesting that we're here in St. Teresa's because both Art and I have a history with a gentleman from St. Teresa's whom I'm sure you all know and who is very well known to this hill and very well known to the Archdiocese of San, uh, San Francisco, Father Peter Salmon, whom uh, wow. um, Art and I both had an opportunity to work with. When did you, um, I remember you went to El Salvador with That's right. That's Father right. Peter, yeah. Before I tell you that story, I just want to acknowledge Peter Lilienthal, who's really a Potrero Hill treasure. And tonight is just one last example of that. And we just, yeah. there supposedly is another history group somewhere in the western part of the city that's some big, large conglomerate. But this is the only one that's an intimate experience on history in a neighborhood like ours. And so he is very special. He's always the guy who puts it together and I'm glad I'm finally part of it. Peter Salmon was a hero of mine that I met early on when I came to Petrero Hill early in uh, 1967 was when I first moved here. And uh, I was, I arrived in San Francisco the year before after graduating from uh, uh, Florida State with my master's in social work and when I first arrived here on a Greyhound bus I uh, got off at 7th and Market and was trying to figure out where this city would let me live and where I could go and and I wound up listening to people who misled me and said well you're a young good-looking guy you ought to be over in the marina where all the young people are living and so I went over to that area and wasn't very comfortable uh, over there. It wasn't my style, it wasn't my background, it wasn't anything connected to me, and I kept looking for a place where I was comfortable from where I had grown up and uh, lived in Massachusetts, where I came from. And so someone said, you ought to try Petrero Hill. And I knew where Petrero Hill was because I was working with the housing authority in the various uh, public housing developments uh, as a social worker. And so I came over here, and one of the first people I met when I came over here as a person who was involved working with the poor and working on social and human rights issues was Father Peter Salmon. And as soon as I met him, I connected with him, and he became a advisor and a mentor of mine. And one of the highlights of our experience together was when he was leading a uh, human rights mission uh, back in the early 80s, uh, 70s, you'll remember that um, uh, El Salvador was a, uh, going through civil wars uh, with dictators and all that kind of thing, and there was a lot of abuse to uh, Catholic nuns. They killed some, and also Archbishop Romero and a number of others who were seriously impacted by the violence there. And Father Salmon uh, decided to put a committee together to go and look at the abuses. And he invited me to come along with him, and I did. I was in the state legislature then, and I went with him. Uh, there wasn't a lot of money for this trip, so we had to share rooms. And I wound up sharing a room with Father Salmon. And Last year you made it a little more salacious. Yeah, I'm about to do that. <laughs> so we slept together, in, uh, but in separate beds. And what's 
the reason I'm bringing this up was in the middle of air, uh, helicopters buzzing around and uh, various uh, military vehicles zooming around the city and loud noises in, near the hotel we were in, I woke up in the middle of the night and I uh, looked over at Father Salmon who was asleep. And he was sleeping in the bed like this. And I kept waiting for him to wake up. But he stayed there in his bed. And the next morning, I woke up and he smiled at me and I said, Doc, did you, did you hear anything last night? I said, no. I said, you slept through that whole thing with your arm, hands across your chest. I said, there must be something to what you're telling me. <laughs> and uh, he convinced me that he knew what it was all about, even though I didn't. And that is a memorable experience for me that I've never gotten over, even now that I'm 85 and thinking about my career. And uh, he is one of the highlights. 85 and getting off the floor like that. <laughs> this is a pretty good thing. I mean, really. <laughs> So Father Salmon was important to me at Goat Hill as well. Uh, when we, this parish was going, he, was, he and the sisters were some of my biggest customers throughout that period of time. The, um, I do remember on the 25th anniversary of Goat Hill Pizza, I had a party down there and we had a, a comedian who came in. And the comedian, of course, according to the style of those days, was a little ribald and promiscuous. And I want to tell you, I remember Lucia and Kathleen sitting there with these terrible jokes. Thank you for being so nice to me, Lucia. Father Salmon was committed to uh, the community at large. He was also committed to the community here um, on Potrero Hill. And when the Good Life grocery store had its um, lease problems, I know that Art helped them out as well. Peter Salmon, How, what was your involvement with the Good well, Life? Well, I was in the state legislature then, and the community came to me, and they were genuinely upset because the Good Life was a spect and is, continues to be, a spectacular uh, food service for our neighborhood. We didn't have that kind of organic material and organic products uh, in the hill. We had some other good markets, uh, like DeRosa. I, I saw the uh, old pictures from Mr. DeRosa's son, and that was the kind of traditional facility that we all used and appreciated. But some of the younger folks that were coming onto the hill were more interested in the organic uh, product, produce, and that's obviously what Good Life was specializing in. And so when they were threatened with uh, eviction because they didn't want to pay the rent that was... 1,000% yeah, increase? Yeah. Did I so we organized, and I used a little of the power that I had to uh, approach the owners, who were not bad people. They were trying to take care of their business, and we established a relationship Anyway, long story, a little shorter, uh, with our group that was the advocates and me, we were able to convince them to delay the eviction until we found a better place, which obviously we, they did, up on 20th Street, and the rest is history. And on 20th Street, I think they moved into the place which was Jean Landreve's, and he was Goat Hill Pizza's landlord. And this incestuous neighborhood of people <laughs> helping people out. It's, it's kind of special. You know, the interesting thing, too, by the way, just to show you we don't hold any grudges on Potrero Hill, Karen, Lester's wife, ran against me as a Peace and Freedom Party just two years before we helped them out. But who was holding that? <laughs> And of course, I didn't vote for you in your first right. assembly you race. So I, was, <laughs> I was a supporter of a different uh, I understand. respected gentleman in the city, Harvey Milk. Um, <laughs> 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 but we all got along in the Absolutely. end. <laughs> Speaking of saving things, what was the saving Daniel Webster um, 
event, activity. Well, Daniel Webster was, uh, has been, and, and some of the people here, the old timers, uh, went there. And it was a, a, a fine elementary school. And the problem was that somehow over the years, it had been de-emphasized by the school board and the school district and all that, and it had never been given the kind of attention and support that it really needed to thrive in the difficult circumstances of those years uh, for education. We also saw a new phenomenon. A lot of young people started to move onto the hill to have their families and children. And so we saw an influx of young people and young kids. We're seeing it today. If you look around, uh, we see a lot more children in the neighborhood. And so they were looking. Oh, they're waving at me over there. <laughs> All right, good deal. <laughs> and, and so um, the mothers, I, I happen to be walking down Connecticut Street. Jennifer and Betty, who's here somewhere, I think. Where are you, Jennifer? Jennifer <laughs> is my neighbor. Uh, a few doors down with her husband Peter and uh, she was, I don't know if she was pregnant or had babies, I can't remember anymore. I know all this stuff, I just can't remember it. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, she, we started talking, she didn't know who I was, she was kind of lamenting that where her kids were going to go to school. I said that uh, if she and her friends, because she had about five or six, well seven I think, seven more women, who were all in the same boat, and they wanted to go to a neighborhood school. And they were worried that there wouldn't be one when their kids were ready. So I said, well, if you do the work, I'll show you how to do it. And so our little group, my eight mothers, who I could run this city with if I had them with me, they were fantastic. <laughs> and we, we worked at the library, we would have uh, practice sessions of how they would pre present themselves to the uh, school board as we lobbied them to keep the school open. It had not had a white kid in it for about 20 years. Well, and, and because the, there were, first of all, few, very few uh, white families with kids at that time, but suddenly, as I said, we were getting an influx and they were growing. And they, these mothers, wanted to go to that school in an integrated school. They didn't want uh, what was uh, happening in other places where uh, there weren't places for minority kids. And so they wanted to give their kids an urban experience as well as a good education. We worked together and convinced the school board that we would uh, renovate the school with parents and kids that would fill it up. And so they didn't think we could do it, they could do it, the mothers, but they gave us a couple of years, and sure enough, uh, the mothers came through and developed a spectacular program to now, it's one of the more popular schools in San Francisco, and one that's truly integrated the way we all want it. Nice to hear that. You, you've been saving things around here as long as I've known you, tell me about Saving Mission Creek, where I've spent a lot well, of my guys, time. Yeah, that's, that's where you are, and I was trying to get your vote, you know, because I hadn't gotten <laughs> it the first time. So Mission Creek is a, everybody knows Mission Creek. It's, a, it's a, a, a very unique, boutique kind of neighborhood of working folks who have their own houseboats there. And suddenly the city was deciding they wanted to clear that Mission Creek channel. Just, and were proposing to evict all of those houseboats. And uh, they were tough people down there. They were not gonna give up easily. They came to me again, I was in the assembly, uh, then to help them uh, advocate for keeping that facility. We weren't doing too well until I got elected mayor. <laughs> and then it was an easy road. It was an easy road, and we changed some things with the redevelopment agency, and uh, everybody wanted to make the new mayor happy, and so <laughs> it changed like that. Um, and uh, we were able to preserve, I think, what do you have, leases there from the port for what? Well, uh, till now, 2055, which is the end of the 99 year yeah. from the original yes. uh, lease way back when. 
I may um, have to run for mayor then, then. Well, I would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough about the saving. Now, how did you get here? Tell me a little bit about Massachusetts. And I, I um, you were born into a Greek community? Yeah, my mother and father were uh, immigrants uh, from Greece, a uh, small village. Uh, they had an interesting start. Uh, my father came here when he was 15 years old. He was recruited by labor bosses then who uh, would go to the southern Mediterranean and recruit young men to come here and work on the railroads. This is in 1915. And my father was 15 years old when he came here to work on the railroads. And uh, then his brothers came and uh, the work was kind of hard. They were working west um, to, uh, to hook up with what was coming from the West. And they were in Chicago, and um, it was hard work. And after a couple of years, my father realized that he needed to get out of this because it was leading nowhere, and he borrowed $500 and started a small shoe shine stand in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, where I grew up, shining shoes next to my father. And I remember very vividly that uh, We'd be shining shoes. There was a, across the street, there was a, a, a telephone company, and uh, the executives would come over and get their newspapers or cigars and cigarettes and get a shine, 15 cents. 15 <laughs> cents. I remember, and my father got the 15 cents, and I prayed for two dimes because I got the nickel. <laughs> and, and so we'd be shining. Uh, shoes, and he would be talking to me in Greek, saying, I want you to be the first in the family to go to college uh -huh. so that you can have your shoes be shined uh -huh. instead of shining. Uh -huh. And that's how I got started. Um, when he was uh, uh, 35, he went back to the old country, to the village, as was the tradition in those days, and uh, presented him as, to his father and said, I'm ready to be married. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, his father went out to the village. He had a good product here because he'd been to America. And the, and the saying in the village, it's right next to where the Olympics were held, the original Olympics were held. They had a saying that said, in America, they are so rich that even the birds wear shoes. <laughs> and, and, and so my mother's family was impressed and paid a dowry of $2,000, which was a lot of money Woo. in 1937, because he was an American and taking their daughter to a very rich place. Uh -huh. Turned out they were in the middle of the Depression in 1937, <laughs> and it was very hard times. And my mother tells me that I had uh, colicky, a colicky bringing because of the tension and difficulty of, of uh, living in a new country in those kinds of difficult times. So I grew up speaking Greek, couldn't speak English. When I went to uh, uh, kindergarten, uh, they threw me out because I couldn't speak English. And uh, my father was summoned to uh, the school to explain why this young boy couldn't speak English. My father had these immortal words. He only had a fifth grade education, but he was so wise. He said, first I taught him the language I know best, which is Greek, and now I send them to you for you to teach them a language you know best, which is English. And that's how I got started. Uh, just one I, My mother used to make these great uh, uh, meatloaf and feta cheese sandwiches and other Greek foods, you know, I'd bring in. And the kids would all say, ooh, that's no good. It smells. They had bologna and, and, uh, and peanut butter and jelly. So I'd go home and say, Ma, can I have Baloney? <laughs> and she would say, Baloney. Baloney. Tell his Baloney. What this is, you know, Baloney? She said, You want Baloney? I don't give you Baloney. I give you good food. I said, Ma, they're making fun of me. She said, uh, Give them a taste. Give them a taste. And that's what I did. I gave them a taste, and pretty soon I was eating their peanut butter jelly sandwiches, and they were eating my lunches. And the reason I tell you that is, you know, some people call me a crazy liberal and progressive and all that. It wasn't from any ideology. It came from practical experience like that. So when kids come today from other parts of the country, Latin America, and, and we have bilingual programs, it comes from my experience being thrown out of school 
because I couldn't speak the language. And I wanted to make sure no other kid ever felt that kind of experience because of language. And so I've always supported bilingual education and things like that that come from my immigrant parents' experience. Same, same experience my mother had, speaking Portuguese at home and failed yep. first grade, thrown out of school, all that kind of Absolutely. experience. Um, so I, I have to ask you, you were raised in uh, Massachusetts, you went to school in uh, Maine, Bates. Uh, the tragedy of the last, I'm just sure that's broken your heart. It's oh. just been a... It was uh, a horrific thing, a hor and so contrary to what Maine is like. I spent I, yeah. uh, five years there, and uh, it is a very homespun state, Lewiston, was the place where Bates uh, bedspreads, if some of you old timers remember, Bates bedspreads were made uh, in the factories there. And uh, Bates was the best school I could get into and, and uh, it turned out to be very important in my development. But uh, I feel very badly for what's going on there. It's changed sure. somehow yeah. and it's not good. Yeah. I read about Bates in the 78.3 cubic feet of materials in the archive, the Art Agnos archive at the San Francisco Public Library. Do you know what 73.8 cubic feet of reading material looked like? It was hard to get through, but I did it in your honor anyway. Thank you. Um, so um, why San Francisco? After I finished graduate school, I went back to uh, Springfield. And uh, not that I was interested in politics, but uh, the East Coast is more class conscious than the West Coast. In the East Coast, uh, one of the first questions you get when you meet somebody, at least in Massachusetts where I was, is, well, what does your father do? Well, he shines shoes. Where did he go to school? He didn't. Uh, yeah. uh, where did you go to school? And who do you know? And it, it troubled me, that kind of classism and all that stuff. Out here, Nobody asked me what my father did. Nobody asked me what my mother did. Nobody asked me wh where they went to school. They just said, who are you? What do you do? And how are you going to be part of our community? And that kind of welcome and freedom is what made me fall in love with San Francisco. I uh, wasn't planning to be in San Francisco. I was heading for San Diego, but there was a girl <laughs> but she wasn't very important, but I stopped to see her, and that let me stay here, uh, caused me to stay here for longer than I expected, and then one thing led to another, and here I am some 55 years later. And, and uh, when you got here, it was just about that time that we met, because I left the seminary in 67, and um, I moved to Potrero Hill. I was living on, um, I guess it was 20th and Missouri. And uh, Father Gene Boyle told oh, yeah. me when I, uh, uh, when I left the seminary, and I was very interested in politics with Clint Riley. We had done the little Turner report. I don't, I don't want to get, when I'm interviewed, I'll tell you about that. Okay. Anyway, we, um, so I asked Leo what, uh, no, I asked Gene Boyle what I should do, and he said, you want to get involved in politics? Leo McCarthy, help Leo McCarthy. And I, I know that Leo was an important mentor to you, yeah. and probably uh, one of the reasons you got yourself into politics. Absolutely, I, I was not interested in politics. I didn't know that when I first came here, uh, I really wanted to be a social worker, and I did it. And uh, uh, as I worked about two years after working in the housing authority, I had this uh, ex magnificent woman supervisor who trained me and I was her assistant. Her name was Effie Robinson. She was an African-American lady who was the first human rights director at the housing authority and she hired me to be her, um, her, to be her assistant. And she taught me a great deal. But after a couple of years, I was a little frustrated because we didn't have power. And we were always trying to get poor people to adjust to something they shouldn't have to adjust to. They should be able to defeat and, and improve their lives. 
And uh, I said, how do we get power? She says, well, there's two ways. One, you have a lot of money and you donate money and they pay it to, politicians will pay attention to you. Two, you have time and you devote your, as a volunteer, your services to them. And, I, and she said, you don't have any money so you ought to go and volunteer. And, and I said, well, who's the best one out there today? And it was Leo McCarthy, uh, who lived on the western side of the city and was running for the, he had been a member of the Board of Supervisors and was running for the state legislature in uh, 1967. So I walked into his headquarters, um, that's where I met Phil, and I walked into his headquarters and he asked me, what can you do? I said, I don't know anything about politics. I didn't know the difference between a bumper strip and a billboard. And uh, he said, he gave me a Democratic Party manual and um, uh, said, take a look at the voter registration. There's a black part of the district here, OMI it was called, and it's underrepresented and under uh, registered. So would you put it together? So I did. And it was one of the best voter registration uh, drives that they had ever had. And so then when I came back, he said, well, have you ever done get out the vote? And I said, no, he gave me the Democratic Party manual. I looked at it, it was kind of easy to do. And we put out a great uh, get out the vote drive, which uh, helped him get elected. And so he asked me, um, what do you want to do? I'd like to have you work for me. I said, I really don't want to get into politics. I said, all I want to do is be able to talk to you about the issues that I care about that we can make a difference about. And so uh, I turned him down. And then he said, uh, a couple of months later, he called me up again and he said, uh, now what do you really want to do? And I said, well, ultimately in a couple of years, I want to go back and get my PhD in social work and teach somewhere. And he said, well, if you come to work for me, I'll teach you more about how to use power to help people than you'll ever learn in any program that you attend. But I will give you time off to go get your doctorate after a year when you get your job in hand. And he was true to his word. He did that. And uh, I started at uh, Berkeley. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year it was. But uh, I started at Berkeley and finished all the coursework for my doctorate. Um, and that got interrupted in 1973 when I got shot. And I was in and out of hospitals for about a year. Um, and by the time I was well again, or 100% again, uh, the opportunity came to run for the state legislature here on this side of the city, which is the part of the city that I love the most. I couldn't say that when I was mayor, but I can now. <laughs> and so I was honored to have the opportunity to run for it with his strong support, which made all the difference in the world. So I, you mentioned it, now I have to ask, the zebra murder spree and your um, unfortunate, were you targeted? No, no, uh, it was uh, uh, Jim Queen, uh, who oh, lives yeah. on the other side of the city over near Star King, uh, uh, was someone who was working on a um, health clinic for um, the uh, Potrero Annex and the Potrero Projects, as well as the greater community over on that side of the city, on that side of the hill. And uh, they were having some red tape problems with um, the health department. And I was in the assembly again. And so uh, one of the big jobs that a good politician does is break through red, red tape and, and shorten things when the community is getting uh, Stonewall. And so he called me to come to a meeting over there uh, in order to uh, help figure out what the solution was. I did. We had a very successful meeting and I agreed that I could help them clear that red tape on Monday morning. This was a Friday night. And as I left the meeting and started heading back to my car, a couple of people stopped me uh, to ask me follow-up questions, which often happens. And as I was sitting there talking to them, uh, this uh, black guy came up to me and uh, shot me twice in the chest. Um, and uh, the women uh, started running away and I ran after them, not realizing that I had been shot. Remember, I come from the Greek god. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I caught up to them and said, um, 
you'll be all right, be all right. And they said, no, it's you, it's you. He's been shot. And I looked down, <laughs> and I've been shot. And I looked back to see who did it, and he was looking at me like, what the hell's the matter with this guy? He didn't go down and turned around and started running away. And then we went to uh, uh, a neighborhood house there, and I said, excuse me, I've just been shot. Would you please call the doctors? I was in shock, and I didn't know what I was doing. I got to tell you one more story that's funny about that. So they came and got me, and I'm going to the hospital. And the old hospital, if you remember, had a big, uh, had a big uh, uh, place uh, where the ambulance would back up. And the, when they knew that it was a shooting, um, they would have the whole team from the ER out there because they called it the golden minute. And so if they could save a minute, they thought it could save a life. So they were all out there, the doctors, the nurses, all the personnel were waiting at the dock, the loading dock, when the ambulance pulled in. Doors open. I'm still conscious. I was in shock, but still conscious. Uh, I had two bullets right here in the chest. And so um, they throw me onto the gurney, and they're sliding me through, running through the corridors to get to the operating room. Uh, I'm going to go down again. So, <laughs> so, so I'm on the gurney. There's these drunk guys over here and all that stuff. And this young doctor, in those days, they wore dresses. And so this young doctor jumps on my, because I had it here, and she starts tearing my clothes off. And, and the other guys are cutting things, and she's pulling my, and her dress is sliding up. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said to her, you know, ma'am, for a lady I just met, you're getting to know me awfully well. <laughs> and she says, <laughs> she says, sir, you have two bullet holes I'm trying to find because they didn't know who they were. <laughs> She's now 60 something and retired in Philadelphia. I try to keep up to, with her because she was the one who ultimately saved my life because it was a serious, serious work. Now, now I know why the last mention in the Wikipedia article is about your practical joking. Um, I can see you getting up and down off the floors and doing it. You're very accomplished. I'm not joking. I'm trying to give them a full experience here. This is, this is the story. And some of you who know me know I do this because it gets the point very vivid. It makes the point very vivid. Indeed it does. We have kind of focused on Petrero Hill, but now let's spend a little time talking about uh, work in the assembly and certainly the mayor's job, which um, also relates to Petrero Hill. But I have to ask you, how would you go about creating 81,000 units of housing by 1931? How would I do it? What would you do? Well, it seems like an impossibility to me. Anyway. Well, I think it is, and I think that, uh, unfortunately, some of the powers behind uh, those requirements and uh, issues are really looking to use it to make more money for market rate housing and not the kind of housing we really need. The problem, the biggest threat that I see in San Francisco is the loss of middle class people. I worry about the poor. I've spent my whole career in service to the poor and will continue as long as I live. But the middle class is in deep trouble in this city because we are not creating the kind of housing we need for them in a very determined way. And as a result, just to take one example, our educational system is in trouble because we cannot attract teachers to this city. And the reason? because the salaries and the opportunities for housing are too difficult. Uh, just to give you an example, um, uh, the starting salary, and I don't have the specifics, but the starting salary in this city for a teacher is somewhere around $65,000 a year. <laughs> $65,000 a year. They retire at 90. 
if they make 30 years. And again, rough numbers. Now, a couple of years ago, Donald Trump, President Donald Trump's HUD, not some liberal Democrat, but Donald Trump's HUD said that if you live in San Francisco and make $92,000 a year, you are officially low income. That's a teacher's whole career in this city. And so they come here, maybe, if we're lucky, and uh, when they're young and out of school and they double up in the mission and we get them for a couple of years, but then they head for Sacramento where they can get a house with the picket fence and all the other kinds of things their professionalism has led them to expect. And the same is true across the board for middle class work, whether it's a nurse, a cop, a restaurant worker. Look at the tough difficulty all our restaurants are having getting people to come and serve us when we come in there. It's because they do not have a place to live. When I was mayor, believe it or not, 30 years ago, I proposed that we build middle class housing in all of Mission Bay. It was not going to be what you see today. It was going to be middle class marina style housing, some three, four bed, three, four story places like we have up on the hill as well. And the whole place, 25,000 units is what I plan. Unfortunately, some people took it to the ballot and I lost that election because people didn't understand what we were doing. Today, they do. And I, if I were mayor today, I shouldn't start that. <laughs> uh, uh, Listen, folks. He's not running. I'm, he's not running. <laughs> but what we really need to do, in my opinion, is to start to save, to start to emphasize um, middle class affordable housing. And what we hear from the industry all too often is, well, we can't afford it, the prices are too low, baloney. If they are, then let's wait until the prices get right and save our land in a land bank until it serves the purpose that's most important in this city, which is middle class housing. And the Giants, by the way, which is the best corporation in our city, the Giants are meeting that challenge with 40% of the units that are being built over there, as you see them going up, almost 1,800, 1,500, whatever the number is, 40% will be for middle-class affordable housing. 40%, including, including 20 single units, and this is John Burton, one of the best politicians this city has ever had, um, insistence that emancipated youth, those kids that come out of, uh, of uh, what do they call it? Foster care. Foster care, right. When they're 18, they get thrown out and they got nothing, nothing. And that will be, they will be living over there in the Giants Project, 20 units set aside just for them, John Burton. So the, the thing that I think you will be always remembered for and perhaps most well regarded was the handling of the earthquake. This city, like no other city, came through a major disaster and you tore down that damned embarcadero yeah. All, yeah. all during your career yeah. as mayor. I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, talk a little bit about I, that whole I'll experience. I mean, the, the tearing down of that market, it, it, that took over the rest of the world in yeah. terms of planning. Yeah. No one would do that again, put a wall up like Frankly, the earthquake was the easiest time, very stressful, very difficult, but the easiest time I had to manage this city because the fabulous people who made up San Francisco, there was no rioting. There was no looting that you see in other places when there are disasters. They came together and they worked together, took care of each other, went up and down high rises to get, take care of elderly people and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't have to worry about that. All I had to do was try to get the money that we needed to start to rebuild the city and all that stuff. But the Embarcadero was a separate project. It was uh, the, the, the feds and the state wanted me to use the $60 million they set aside for that to repair it. 
And I was never a fan of the freeway. I thought it was a disaster for the eastern side of the city along the Embarcadero. The ferry building, which is a central place for visitors to go see, as well as San Franciscans along the Embarcadero, was closed up. It was used by um, Clint Eastwood for Dirty Harry movies, and that was it. <laughs> that was it, because the freeway was literally as closer to the, um, to the building, to the ferry building, as the separation between the two walls up there. It was even closer. It was a mess. So I decided, with the good advice that I got from people who knew better than I did, to tear it down. And that led me to a lot of other troubles, politically speaking, because <laughs> the northeast part of the city, Fisherman's Wharf, Knob Hill, uh, Telegraph Hill, Chinatown especially, the financial district, liked the easy access and entrance to the bridge. And so they wanted to keep it up as ugly as it was. And uh, I had 22,000 people sign a petition to keep it up. And I was running for a re-election. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So uh, it didn't turn out well for me, but it did turn out well for the city because <laughs> we decided to tear it down and uh, create what you see today along the Embarcadero, the most popular spot for residents and visitors in the city. And, and now, um, I kind of want to open it up for questions, but I want to ask you about, since we're here in St. Teresa's Church, I yeah. want to ask you about one other person in your life who surprised you one Saturday night. Why one don't Sunday you tell night, us yeah. about Sunday night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-oh, he's going to get on the floor again? I'm I not. I got to stand up. I don't. <laughs> This is the best story of my political career. <laughs> it really is. Some of you, Rosemary has seen it, heard it, but this is a great story. Stick with me. <laughs> One of the ch issues that we had um, as a family, Sherry and I with the kids, one of the issues we had was trying to be normal as a family because with the tragedies that have happened to the mayor and Harvey Milk in um, in our history, uh, the assassinations and all that, we have bodyguards all over. We can't leave the house without bodyguards. I had a team for various shifts of about 12 bodyguards. And it's hard to be normal as a family when you have a cop with you all the time, <laughs> especially if you go out and drive somewhere. You know, normal families, dad's driving, mom's in the passenger side, the kids are in the back. And if they act out, you say, okay, knock it off or you're gonna get it. But you can't growl, you can't growl at your kids when a cop's there. So every now and then we would tell a little lie and say, we're not going anywhere. And on this Sunday night, we went to my mother's house for a Greek dinner. And on the way back, Sherry remembers that we didn't have any milk for breakfast the next day. So I said, well, take the kids upstairs, get them ready for, 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 uh, for bed, and I'll go get the milk. On the way home from the, with the milk, the phone in the car rings, and it's Sherry in a very animated tone of voice saying, Art, Art, Mother <laughs> Teresa's coming up the stairs. <laughs> Mother Teresa's coming up the stairs. Are you kidding me? No, she's got two nuns. What do I do with her? <laughs> I'll open the door, let her in. I'll be right there with the milk. And sure enough, I get inside, and I look in our living room, and there on the couch is Mother Teresa, just like what's in your head right now. <laughs> and two nuns. Hello, Mother. What brings you here? She had a very soft tone of voice. She's very tiny, and I had to bend down like this to listen to her. <laughs> and she says, I have come to talk to you about the work of God. <laughs> Sherry's upstairs trying to get the kids in their Sunday clothes so they could meet her, but they didn't want to. They were already half asleep. So I said, well, Mother, what is it? And she had found a building on the corner of Turk and Fillmore. Uh, it's still there. And someone had told her it might be a city-owned building, and uh, she wanted it. <laughs> and she said, where's the mayor live? I'll go ask him. And somehow she <laughs> found her way to my house. This is 9 o'clock at night, Sunday night. And I said, well, Mother, I think I know that building. And tomorrow morning, I will get right on it. She says, the work of God cannot wait. <laughs> so, 
I said, okay, what do you have in mind? She was, we must go now. Now? It's 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, mother. It, that's cold. This was in uh, December, I think, of 1988. It's cold, it's dark, and that neighborhood can be a little sketchy at night. She says, do not fear. God will protect us. <laughs> and so to make sure God protected us, I call for my bodyguards, <laughs> and they were there. And off we go to the corner of Turk and Fillmore. Uh, we're in my mayoral car, the, the bodyguard's driving, Sherry and Mother Teresa and I are there, and her uh, other nuns are following us in her car. We get down to the corner of Turk and Fillmore. It's now about 10.30, 11 o'clock. We're looking at this building. It's not marked. There's nothing there. We can't figure out if it's a city-owned building. And so we walk around the back, and there was a chain-link fence, and, um, and uh, there was a hole in it. So I walk through it. She comes with me, the bodyguard. We're all, and there in the back are about eight or nine homeless guys, half of them are black, half of them are white, they're trying to, trying to keep warm with a fire in a barrel. And they see us coming. And they come up and they recognize me first. It's the mayor, what are you doing here, Mr. Mayor? I brought somebody famous to see you. They look at her, it's Mother Teresa, and they recognize her. <laughs> true, true. And so, so, uh, <laughs> I said, we're trying to figure out who owns this building because mother wants it for a place for the homeless. They said, well, it's a city-owned building, but we've been living here for the last five years or so. <laughs> I said, okay, mother, there you go. It sounds like I can do something for you, and tomorrow morning, I'll get right on it. So we start to leave to go back to our cars, and um, we get to the car, and I said, mother, can I ask you a question? She says, yes, what is it? She, I said, uh, do you do this often? <laughs> she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, do you go to the mayor's house late at night on a Sunday night and ask for buildings like this? She says, oh, yes, I do it all the time. <laughs> she knew who she was. And, um, I said, well, who was the last mayor you did it to? Remember, this is back in 1988. She says, Mayor Koch in New York. <laughs> and you know, he has a much nicer house than you do. <laughs> of course, if you, you know you're, uh, the mayor of New York has Gracie Mansion, which is provided by the, <laughs> but we here have our own homes. So I said, and she had a little smile. So I said, oh, you like to tease a little, huh? I said, well, mother, you know, I don't do these things for free, you know. She says, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to try to get you a building from the city. I said, I'm a politician. You've got to do me a favor. I'm going to do you one. She didn't hesitate. She says, yes, what is it? And then Sherry was doing this first lady project. Back then, the fentanyl crisis was crack cocaine uh. in, in those years. And it was just as terrible. And she had made it uh, her mission as first lady to create a facility for crack-addicted pregnant women. And because we knew that if we got them off of drugs fast enough, early enough, they could give birth to a healthy baby. And so she was working on this project. I said, well, my wife has this project. I'd like you to come and see sometime next time you're here uh, in the city and uh, so you can see it. And she says, let's go now. <laughs> I knew it. She was unbelievable. 11 o'clock at night. So I called the hospital. I said, this is the mayor. I'm coming with Mother Teresa in about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> they was bedlam. Because you know who works at night on Sunday night? It ain't the big shots. It ain't the executives. It ain't the top doctors. It's the only a lot of Latino workers and all that kind of stuff. So we get there, and she goes up to the neonatal unit and blesses there were about 11 or 12 babies, day old, just born, going through withdrawal, and she would reach into the, neo, into the uh, incubator and bless each one and leave the medallion that she would give everyone when she blessed them. And there were about 11 of them. And then we went down to the AIDS ward and she blessed each one of those guys and left the medallion and we started our way out. And the old hospital had a large room, about the size of this church, uh, a little less, but 
um, that was the entryway and exit. So as we're walking out, we turn around, happen to turn around, and there's about 75, 80, 100 people following us. <laughs> so she turns around to speak to them. And she says this. I've memorized it, and it's embedded in my mind. She said, when you all die and go to heaven, God's going to be waiting for you, and he's going to thank you for what you're doing for these sick babies and these sick men. Because in taking care of them, you're taking care of his son, Jesus Christ. And with that, she left. It was about two years later, I lose the election. <laughs> And uh, it's my last day in office. She's in town. And we get together, and huh. we go out to see the facility that Sherry built as her first lady project, because it was alive, and there were 18 women going through withdrawal. And we took Mother Teresa out there. She blessed each one of those women. This isn't a movie now, by the way. Um, <laughs> blessed each one of those women and their babies, that, those that had had them. And, uh, and then she left, and I've never seen her. And then she died a few years later, and I didn't see her again. But last year, some 30 years later, Sherry got a call from Georgiana. Georgiana Wooten, who was one of the first mothers who was blessed and met by Mother Teresa. She had a 30-year-old daughter who was the first baby born there. It's called Jelani House. It's still there. Some 300 babies since then have been born healthy and grown there at Jelani House. That's my wife. That's not me. That's her. So, and her, Georgiana's daughter, Georgiana said to Sherry, she said, I was one of the first. And she says, I've none of us that were seen and blessed by Mother Teresa ever regressed. We all were successful, and all our babies are grown and healthy, and mine is now a, has her uh, master's degree in engineering, and she's working for the county in Dallas. I've been in uh, the hospitality industry ever since, and we all stay in touch with each other because of the experience we had with Mother Teresa. That's my story. <laughs> But, but, All right, we're going to make a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's very clear that we've used up all our time, but we have to, and it's, we could go on. That's the worst part of it. And I have a full two pages of questions I haven't even asked. So anyway, I know, I know, I know. I, I, a couple of burning questions. This one is burning. Were you living on Potrero Hill when Mother Teresa came, and what is the name of the movie? No. Um, we, yeah, Mayor's House in West Portal. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, when I got elected, we spent my first year as mayor, when I got elected in 1988, uh, my first year we spent up here, but the house, the, the apartment in our condo was too small for what I had to do as entertaining, people as mayor and all those kinds of things. We needed a more formal, traditional house. So after the first year, we moved over to Twin Peaks, um, which was a traditional house where I could do the kinds of things that the mayor has to do to entertain people and all that stuff. And then we moved to West Portal until the kids got out of school. And when we became empty nesters, thank God I did not sell that place at 641, 637 Connecticut. One more. Right there. Mayor Agnos, San Francisco is a mess. Oh, it no. It needs someone with your skills. <laughs> Would you please run for mayor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sit down for this one. I promise not to ask that question. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you very much. OK, we gotta, we're not being fair to Tom. We've got to get Tom up here. I want to hear what he's got to say. Well, we're not going to cut him short. Don't worry. We have a couple more questions. Oh, running for mayor? Running for mayor, yeah. Oh. No. 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 <laughs> All right. You've heard it here. What's your opinion about uh, reopening the shipyards in San Francisco? 
reopening the shipyards. Reopening the shipyards? I'm sorry, uh, uh, is that the shipyard out at Hunter's Point? All of them. I'm sorry, I don't understand. When so I, you're talking about shipbuilding and all of yes. that, or are you oh, talking I, about? I want to know your opinion in regards of this, because you, the other gentleman, talked about the dire situation in San Francisco, which is coming cyclically usually, because of the drugs and the markets and housing and everything else. Keith, you got to help me. Do you know what the issue is? The, um, there is a proposal I put through to the United States Navy and the United States Congress to reopen all the shipyards in San Francisco as to who I am or what I've done before for the United States military usually. So I want to know the opinion. So uh, you're asking, you're saying there is a proposal before the Congress to reopen yes, all the shipyards in San Francisco? Through, I'm not familiar with I'm this. I'm not either, but I, I think I that know it would be difficult. Part of I, th I think we better ask that question as somebody who knows something about politics, yeah. not you guys. I'm sorry, I don't know about it. <laughs> All right, one more, one more. I don't know. Who I, wants I'm it? I'm not up to date, but I'll try to get up to date on it. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, sir. In <laughs> regards to housing and affordable housing, what's the definition, the amount? Because if you say 500000 the average teacher can afford that. How is it defined? Well, it, it, there is no specific, that I know of, a specific number. We, we re, I, but I'm thinking somewhere between 300 and 700,000, the range, because they do have ranges in affordable housing, some cheaper than others, depending on what the makeup is. But it has to be, it has to be under a million dollars. It has to be somewhere in the mid-range. and. Uh, while I've been the benefit of this terrible uh, rise in prices, a place that I bought for $52,000 in 1972 is now, I'm uh, being told, um, as estimated to be $2 million. That breaks my heart because it means someone like me can't buy it anymore. And that's the tragedy that threatens this city. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor Art Agnos. It's been a real pleasure hey, talking um, with you. I, the one question, you, you don't have to answer it. The one, the one question I really want the answer to is how could such a progressive, forward-looking, and effective mayor have lost the damned election to Jordan? <laughs> anyway, I'm I, not, I, I'm I, not I, real. Sorry, <laughs> I have a question for Mayor Art Agnos. <laughs> Who are you supporting for mayor in 2024? Oh. Who are you supporting for mayor next year? We'll find. I've made no decision yet. When all the candidates are in, I don't think they're all here yet, we'll have, a, I think, a very good choice uh, to make a decision about, but I'm not making one yet because I don't know all the candidates. Sounds like you're waiting for Aaron Peskin. <laughs> Thanks very much, Phil. Go Hill Phil and Mayor Agnos! <laughs> now you know how you become a successful politician when you've got the gift of the gab and a giant heart like art. <laughs>